part because they were friends, and she knew she could count on him as an ally. True to his easygoing double martini image, Martin seemed utterly unfazed by Monroe's absences and delays. All right. Camera. Dean was wonderful. Dean Loader. He was just very patient and understanding. And when he was waiting, he'd be in the back swinging his golf yeah, ball. You know, yeah, you know, had a club with him, and guy. he'd go behind the set and just swing it away. Put some shots. Dean Martin never said a word. He sat in his dressing room and. I mean, he knew I was young and worried and inexperienced. He would come and comfort me instead of me come and comfort him. Weinstein once again was in need of comfort. On the 27th of May, Marilyn phoned in sick, and again on the 28th. She reported to the set on June 1st, her 36th birthday, but the mood was grim. Cukor, desperate to make some headway, was furious over plans to throw a birthday party on the set and refused to let Marilyn go until the end of the day. Ironically, the tense afternoon produced one of the film's funnier scenes, a vintage Monroe tease in which she tries to pass Wally Cox off as the man with whom she spent five years on a deserted island. Thank you. I really don't have very much time. I'm making a report to the Geographic Society on the flora and fauna we found on the island. Mm -hmm. This, as it turned out, would be the last scene of Marilyn Monroe's career. Uh, ask anything. Go ahead, ask. Oh, well, let me see. Oh, what kind of an island was it? Uh, oh, I'd say it was a, uh, an ordinary island, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Mm, like the rest. Small island? Not small. Not large. Medium. Water? Oh, yes, water all around. That's one of the nicest things about Adam. He doesn't talk your ear off. Well, is there anything else you'd like to ask? No, I don't think so. I, I've got a good, clear picture now. Well, then, should I be running along? Must you? Oh, the Geographic Society insists on punctuality. Well, fine. Thank you. All day long, birthday flowers and bottles of champagne arrived for Marilyn. The studio had prepared nothing to mark Monroe's birthday, but Marilyn's stand-in, Evelyn Moriarty, bought a cake, decorated with a bikini and a negligee, and had a giant birthday card signed by everyone on the set. I went over to the farmer's market and picked up the cake, and I brought it back to the studio, and I was told by the assistant director not to bring that cake out until 6 o'clock, because they were going to get a full day's work out of her. So we left the cake in, in the prop room, and at 6 o'clock we wheeled out the cake with all the sparklers on it. Somehow or another, I ended up with one of the little dolls that was on the top of the cake. They had sparklers and these little dolls, and there was a, um, a uh, little bikini-clad Marilyn was, the, uh, was on the cake. And normally these things get thrown away, but my wife has a little doll collection that's been sitting there for years this way. The um, rather revealing wardrobe, I must say. Cukor joined the other cast and crew members in a ragged version of Happy Birthday, but it was not a warm serenade. There was a pall over it. We had gone through so much. It was a pretend celebration. And she felt that, you know, it was a very sad birthday that uh, because of all the troubles with the pictures that, we, that were happening and all that. And she always looks at that photograph where she's, I guess it's on the set, and she says, you know, I may be smiling, but my eyes are dead, you know, because she wasn't smiling on the inside. It wasn't working. You know, they would probably have thrown it at her if they would have been honest. Wearing a mink beret borrowed from the Fox costume department, Monroe left the strain gathering with Wally Cox. Over objections from the studio, she went to an angel game to throw out the opening ball at a muscular dystrophy benefit. It would be her last public appearance before she died. On June 4th, the Monday after her 36th birthday, Marilyn Monroe once again failed to show up on the Something's Got to Give set. A new and final round of absences had begun. Monroe called in sick again on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, and on Thursday. According to studio doctor Lee Siegel, her sinuses had flared and her temperature was 102. There was no telling when she would be able to return to work. I didn't believe him for a minute. I don't think Cukor did. I don't think anybody in the crew did. She wasn't out partying. She wasn't out doing anything. She was just, she was just being miserable. Yes, this is a sick woman, and uh, 
And also feeling this is also a movie star. This is a movie star who is getting her way. What she is doing, she's doing be because she's a movie star and doesn't give a damn about anybody else and is uh, being destructive and self-destructive. A crisis point in the filming of Something's Got to Give had been reached. The production was now 16 days behind schedule and a million dollars over budget. Not a huge deficit, but a traumatic one given the spectacular drain of Cleopatra, still filming in Europe and still Fox's only other big movie. Studio chief Peter Levathes, in Rome trying to stem the hemorrhage of Cleopatra, was furious when told of Monroe's latest absences. We've let the inmates run the asylum, he railed, and they've practically destroyed it. Levathes ordered his staff to line up a possible replacement for Monroe. The panicky studio began calling every actress in town, according to one report. Rumors were flying that Monroe was about to get the axe. But what exactly was the matter with Marilyn Monroe? What happened that weekend, I don't know. To me, that's more interesting than what happened the, the day that Marilyn died. That was the turning point. I think she was just depressed. I mean, it wasn't like she didn't want to do it. She wanted to get the film done. She didn't want to be fired. She was just in, in a terrible place by this time. There was something desperate and mysterious about Monroe's actions. On June 5th, she reportedly tried to discuss something's got to give with Levathe's boss, 20th Century Fox president Spiros Skouros, even though he was recovering from surgery in the intensive care unit of a New York hospital. On June 7th, Monroe visited a plastic surgeon. She had been taking too much medication, she said, had fallen in the shower and bruised her face. That same day, emergency calls were placed to Monroe's psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, who was vacationing in Switzerland. Greenson flew back to Los Angeles that night and gave the studio a guarantee that Monroe would be on the set and able to finish the film by Monday. Start again. But it was too late. When she failed to appear on Friday, June 8th, Levathe's fired Marilyn Monroe. Punctuating the action with an exclamation point, he ordered his lawyers to file a $500,000 breach of contract suit against the actress that same day. We can't afford to have her and Cleopatra too, a studio official explained. Monroe was stunned. She was terribly upset. But she couldn't believe that the studio had fired her. She, that was very difficult to accept. I mean, it was like she was gold breaking. And that, that she was doing this as a willful child. And, uh... I mean, it was, I mean, I think she felt really degraded by it. Even with your own children, there comes a time when you have to make decisions. But something can't continue. Something's got to happen. Something's got to give is what it was. Something's got to give, and the studio said, I've taken all I can, and I think they justifiably did. The day Monroe was fired, producer Weinstein lashed out at her in the press for, quote, completely flouting professional discipline and putting 104 people out of work. He has since revised that view. The reason Marilyn, the real reason Marilyn was fired was that you had Cleopatra way behind schedule and costing millions. The studio sold the backlight to help finance it. You now have this small little picture on about a half a dozen sets and 20 people maybe, and that's behind. And it looks like Scorus and his appointed head Levathe are losing control over their talent. I mean, this is only, we look at Marilyn Monroe, but I try to point out this is a small pawn in the whole studio thing. It's an interesting pawn. It's very sad, it's tragic, it's funny, but it's a pawn to the whole, really, what happens. And that's the real Hollywood story.